Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, Nordic Partner webinar today in cooperation with uh, Lumen Radio. Uh, together with us today we have two uh, uh, hosts, two speakers from Lumen Radio, uh, Peter and Eric. I let them introduce themselves uh, now. Good morning everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Lindqvist. I'm the uh, Global Sales and Marketing Director for Lumen Radio. So I interact with all our customers uh, globally. Uh, and I will present uh, something around our core technology today. Nice to meet you. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Erik Oskog and I'm responsible for all the customers that we have within HRAC and building automation. And I'm going to give you like a short introduction to what we're doing in this field and some customers that we also have. Thanks. And they are here to talk about uh, uh, industrial grade uh, wireless mesh for uh, HVAC and building automation. Uh, my name is Robin M. Saltness. I'm a product marketing engineer at Nordic Semiconductor and I'll be working behind the scenes uh, in this uh, webinar today. And First, I'll go through some practicalities. Uh, the duration of this uh, webinar is about 60 minutes. We encourage everyone to ask questions. Please use the questions box in the top right corner for your questions. So all your questions are anonymous. Please try to keep them relevant to the topic. We will answer them towards the end, the last 10 or 15 minutes of the presentation is Q&A. Uh, the chat is not anonymous, and we discourage you from asking questions in chat as it is, uh, can be uh, distracting uh, and not anonymous. If you have any further questions that are not uh, answered in the presentation or in the Q&A, you can go to devson.nordic.nordicsemi.com for Nordic questions or luminradio.com slash developers for <coughs> development guides and supports for Lumen Radio products. Also, our recording of this webinar will be made available along with the slides from the webinar uh, sometime during this week. Uh, thank you. Then I'll just give the word back over to uh, Peter and Eric. So, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, quickly uh, walk you through the agenda we're going to use today. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to make a quick introduction uh, of Lumen Radio. Uh, then uh, I'm going to focus on one of the core subjects today, cognitive, cognitive coexistence, our technology for adaptive frequency hopping. Then we are going to talk a bit about our concurrent Bluetooth feature. Uh, then I will hand over uh, things to Eric, who will talk about uh, our offer within HVAC and building automation more in, in specific. Uh, why wireless technology is adding value and what kind of products we and also our customers have, have built for this application. And then we will wrap things up by doing a, a question and answers at the end. So let's get started. First of all, uh, Lumen Radio, uh, we are a Swedish company uh, and as the, the name implies, we have our roots within lighting. Uh, and I will come back a bit uh, about that uh, further on, uh, where we sort of come from. Uh, we are today uh, about 45 employees. Uh, we're spread across four uh, different uh, locations, uh, two in Sweden, uh, where we have our headquarters in Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast. And then we have a sales and support office, both in Frankfurt in Germany and also in Boston in the US. Uh, I mean, as a technology company, we uh, believe in uh, filing and defending uh, patents. Uh, we believe that our IP is, is one of the ways that we can sort of manifest our technology leadership. So we have a portfolio of 18 patents at the moment that we're continuously trying to grow. Um, we also have a, a strong uh, base of owners. Uh, and we have now 13 years in the business. We were founded in 2008. Uh, and um, yeah, so I wouldn't consider ourselves a startup anymore. We see ourselves more as a technology scale up. We're still a small company, but we're growing uh, rapidly at the moment. 
Uh, our role in the uh, what we like to call the IoT value chain is that we offer what we call uh, device to device uh, connectivity. So we're not really building products in the sense that we are, you know, building sensors or actuators or, or other devices. And we're not offering any cloud solutions or analytics uh, or, or sort of AI platforms or, or such. We are focusing on the connectivity between products. So the communication between uh, devices that you use in, uh, in the networks, so to speak. Um, the radio technology that we focus on is uh, local uh, network, so uh, sort of um, uh, not wide area solutions, but rather local area solutions, and narrow band and low power radios, such as, uh, I mean, Bluetooth that we will talk uh, a lot about today, but also 802.15.4, so Zigbee and Thread radios uh, we have experience of, of working with. Um, our offering consists of, uh, or we offer our technology at three different levels. Uh, we do have both end user devices. Uh, you can basically see them as a, as a wireless cable. Uh, and here we will talk a bit more about one of the products that we offer today, uh, specifically used within HVAC and building automation. And that's something Eric will come back to later on. Uh, but then we offer uh, radio modules. So for integration uh, into devices or products by an, typically an OEM. And we also license our embed software, our operating system that we call Myra OS, which then contains our meshing communication stack that we call Myra Mesh. Uh, and normally we also see our customers sort of climbing uh, this sort of staircase or, well, it's the other way around in the picture. Uh, you start from the top and as sort of uh, volumes grow, you work yourself to the bottom. Because obviously if you have huge volumes, uh, there's a, uh, you have a cost advantage of you know, building the hardware yourself, of course, while you still might want to have the unique benefits that our software offers. So that is uh, Lumen Radio in a nutshell. Uh, and we'll be happy to, to answer questions about the company as well uh, at the end. But now I will move into the uh, sort of the core of the, uh, the presentation where we deep dive into a couple of uh, sort of the aspects of our technology. And, and first out, we have what we call a cognitive coexistence uh, in more, let's say, scientific or, or geeky terms, you can also call it uh, real-time chaotic adaptive frequency hopping. And uh, to explain a bit why we have developed this, I think I have to sort of uh, take you, uh, you know, sort of back to 2008 and talk a bit about the history of Lumen Radio. Our roots are within the uh, professional lighting industry. I mean, the kind of lighting that you would use at the Eurovision Song Contest at the Super Bowl, if you go to the opera uh, or a theater, or if you would visit uh, a production set for a, a film or a TV series. The kind of lighting fixtures that you have there is, I mean, they're very expensive, very specialized, uh, and typically very bright, and, and uh, very cool, if you ask me as well. Uh, but in this environment, uh, you, if you want to use wireless technology to control your fixtures, which is uh, becoming more and more popular, uh, you expect a very, very high level of reliability. Uh, it's not a life or death business, but it's definitely sort of a, a no-nonsense business in the sense that if you're doing live broadcasting of the Super Bowl, you only get one chance at succeeding. If, if you sort of mess that up, uh, you're fired, uh, basically. Um, and in these environments, you typically also have a lot of interference uh, brought to the venue by the audience. Uh, I mean, in, at the Eurovision, for example, you might have a live audience of uh, 20, 30,000 people, each with their phone up, uh, tweeting, uh, taking pictures, sharing on Instagram and so forth. Uh, and also other wireless equipment uh, present uh, in the same environment. And, and this is where cognitive coexistence was, was born. Uh, it's, it's, it's a technology to mitigate 
heavy interference. And I think another thing that we have sort of recognized as a company, I mean, uh, interference is increasing due to the uh, sort of the more frequent use of, of wireless devices in society. But what we also see is that, I mean, license-free spectrum is becoming more and more a, a scarce natural resource. Uh, I mean, today there are only a few license-free or globally unlicensed frequency band bands where, I mean, the 2.4 uh, frequency band is the most popular and also most commonly used. And that's actually also where, where we normally work, because that is where our customers want to be. But if, if you look at the, uh, the license-free bands, we, we see it as a scarce natural resource that you need to take care of. Because, I mean, as society develops and, and the number of wireless devices increase, I mean, we have no way of creating new frequency bands. I mean, they are what they are. And as long as we're not able to, you know, convince, you know, people like the US military and so forth to let go of the, uh, the bands that they have sort of um, uh, reserved for, for their purposes, I mean, you don't have a lot of choices. Uh, so that means that in, in, in the 2.4 gigahertz band, it's becoming very, very crowded. Now, I think in the old days, when you looked at, you know, radio communications in the licensee free bands, I mean, we had a similar approach to the one that we had to oil in the 60s and 70s. I mean, back then we just, you know, pumped and pumped and pumped. If we needed more energy, if we needed more oil, yes, you know, get it up of the, of the ground and let's use it. But I think that approach is, is becoming obsolete in the energy business. And I think the same approach in, in, in sort of RF terms, meaning that you just retransmit and retransmit and retransmit and you use maybe more and more and more output power. It doesn't work. It's not sustainable when, uh, you know, traffic will increase and number of devices will uh, skyrocket. So I think uh, what we're providing is, uh, I mean, in a very congested environment, uh, and we like to make this sort of a uh, metaphor is that uh, in a big traffic jam, we are basically providing a, a scooter or a Vespa, as we would say in, 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 in some parts of Europe. Um, because in, in this sort of huge traffic jam, our communication is able to constantly switch lanes, as in switching channels, and we're also able to detect you know, which of the lanes is going to move the fastest in, in the next sort of period of time. So we are literally, literally like the, the scooter or the Vespa, you know, passing between the cars, sometimes maybe even going in the ditch, uh, but always, you know, finding a way through this uh, congestion. And, and how it works is that um, cognitive coexistence uh, in our networks, each device builds what we call a predictive model of the, the frequency space. And I mean, cognitive, that means that, I mean, that's cognitive in the sense that each device is cognizant of what's happening around it. And sort of every, all devices are listening and taking notes of, of, of the environment and coexistence as in that we adapt to the environment and we do our best to coexist with, with other solutions or with other simply sort of equipment that is uh, active in the, uh, in the RF uh, sort of frequency uh, spectrum. And if you look at this uh, animation that you now see on the screen, it's a recording of the, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency band. Uh, and the orange bars, it's competing traffic that we detect in, you know, in, in the same environment, uh, while the green bars is actually the traffic that we are sending uh, in, the, uh, in the band, in the network at that point in time. So what the devices do is that they listen for competition, and that can be competition from other wireless solutions or just simply you know, interference, electromagnetic radiation caused by some kind of electrical appliance or, you know, a poorly insulated electrical motor, maybe, for example, and, and tries to avoid it uh, and tries to adapt to it and also tries to predict it. 
to make sure that we are or that we remain reliable. And again, I mean, primarily we do this for egoistical reasons. Uh, but I mean, it's also, you know, tolerant uh, to others because, yeah, we, we, we simply try to avoid uh, the others and also the, in that sense, utilizing the spectrum in a more efficient way. So, I mean, the, the benefits with, with, you know, having such a technology uh, are a number, but I mean, sort of at the end of the day, it gives you reliability also in very, very difficult radio environments. Um, I mean, if you have a lot of competition in the air, I mean, our technology can adapt to that and remain reliable where other technologies might fail and, and you might start dropping a lot of packets. I mean, you also become immune to future interference, uh, I mean, introduced by things outside of your control. I mean, a very common example is that, I mean, you might install a, a solution in a, maybe in a commercial building that is empty uh, when you, you do your commissioning and installation. Uh, and then, you know, the tenants move in, they put up their Wi-Fi's, they, they do all kinds of weird, th weird things outside of your control. And then all of a sudden you start to get service calls and, and, and experience, experiencing reliability problems. I mean, what our technology gives you is actually, you know, immunity to these future uh, disturbances because we would adapt to them on the fly without anyone, you know, being required to visit the installation or to sort of change anything. It's, it's taken care of by the solution itself and, and it never stops. Uh, during the lifetime of the product, this technology will work for you in the background. Um, then another very important benefit is that as we're doing this adaptive frequency hopping uh, and, and you know, achieving this coexistence, uh, also spreading our energy across the whole radio spectrum, uh, I mean, from a regulatory perspective, we are seen as a, sort of as a model citizen from an RF perspective, um, which means that we are able to um, certify uh, our products for a higher output power compared to a normal Bluetooth or Zigbee or Thread product. Uh, we are allowed to transmit with up to 100 milliwatts, while other solutions that do not show or you know, have this adaptivity are limited to 10 milliwatts. And, and that sort of additional horsepower uh, can be very, very helpful. It, it, it allows you to make a much more forgiving system because, I mean, with range, you also uh, make it easier for the installer or for the user to, uh, to put up a network without doing any kind of radio planning uh, whatsoever. And it also allows you to penetrate uh, physical objects uh, better, which is important in, in, in environments such as commercial buildings, where you might have fire doors, glass partitions, uh, yeah, multiple floors and, and, and so forth. Uh, you also get a more responsive network uh, thanks to uh, fewer retransmissions. If, you, if you're always transmitting on the best available channel, the likelihood of, of you being interfered uh, with is, is, is much less. And that means that we can see that on, when we compare the packet delivery rates that we achieve with that of the, um, the standard solutions available on the market, we see that we are significantly above those. Uh, I mean, that obviously is, is part of the reli reliability aspect, but it also gives you a more expensive network because latencies uh, decrease. It's of course also helpful from a power consumption perspective because uh, every retrans retransmission costs in, in, in the form of uh, power consumption. And, and last but not least, I mean, since we are tolerant to others and adapt to others, we're also sort of providing our customers and their products sort of a, we call it a CIO insurance. Because if you're sort of deploying products in a commercial building and, and then you have tenants moving in, uh, I mean, typically they put up their Wi-Fi networks and, and this is, you know, business critical infrastructure for their business. 
So if you then, uh, or if someone then accuses you of interfering, you know, with their Wi-Fi uh, or with, uh, you know, maybe a point of sales system in, in a retail outlet or any other kind of, you know, business critical system uh, deployed by the end user, uh, you know, <laughs> you will most likely face criticism. But I think what, what we can then, you know, give our customers is that as we adapt and as we try to avoid all other systems as much as possible, we provide sort of an insurance uh, for this, uh, which has proven very you know, helpful in, in a number of cases. So to, something up, to sum things up uh, regarding cognitive coexistence, it's, I would say it's, it's the innovation that, that Luma Radio was sort of uh, founded upon. Uh, it's, you know, it's adaptive frequency hopping, but on steroids. Uh, we do it in, in real time. Uh, and the, uh, the main, I mean, you get benefits both regarding reliability, latency and power consumption. And I mean, the beautiful thing is, of course, that you don't require, it, it does not require any, you know, special hardware or any special silicon. Uh, I mean, we take, you know, uh, off the shelf Bluetooth radios and, and we, we love to work with the, uh, the Nordic Semiconductor uh, Conductor Silicon. And we basically performance tune it to perform even better uh, with our embedded software. Um, that was the first part. Um, now I will talk a bit, apart, uh, talk a bit about uh, another feature that we offer uh, that we call concurrent Bluetooth. Uh, I mean, this is also one of the unique things that we offer. I mean, cognitive coexistence uh, that I just mentioned. Here we, as far as we know, we, we, we are unique uh, on the market offering that kind of, uh, you know, adaptive frequency hopping. And also when we talk about concurrent Bluetooth, here we also believe we are, you know, truly unique because we haven't seen any other solution offering uh, a similar uh, or offering similar possibilities. Uh, and, and just to introduce this, uh, when we are building uh, meshing uh, networks, uh, we are working with uh, a topology where you have basically three different roles in the network. Um, we have a gateway, or as we call it sometimes, a root node. It is the blue dot in this uh, illustration. Uh, we then have sort of normal, I would say, uh, meshing nodes. Uh, which is the, uh, the green dots in this uh, illustration. And then we have what we call leaf nodes, which are the, uh, the gray hexagons uh, in this uh, illustration. And as we are running uh, the Bluetooth or we are using the Bluetooth physical layer of the Nordic uh, chipsets uh, that we are uh, running on, uh, I mean, we, we have a Bluetooth radio sort of at our disposal. In the uh, meshing network it, itself, it's, it's not using the, um, the Bluetooth stack uh, provided by, by Nordic. There we are, you know, we have developed our own stack and that's where we do the, uh, the adaptive frequency hopping and so forth. But uh, we have developed technology where we are able to timeshare uh, the radio between multiple stacks. And in this case, we will talk about uh, time sharing uh, the radio between the Myra mesh stack for the mesh and then the, the Nordic BLE stack, I mean, the Nordic soft device uh, to establish uh, a BLE point-to-point uh, -point -point connection. And, and, and the beauty here is that we can do it concurrently. So from sort of the application's perspective or from the user's perspective, it, it sort of seems like it's done truly sort of in, in parallel or at the same time, while in fact, it's actually the radio doing one thing at a time. Sometimes it's, it's being used for maintaining the BLE point to point connection. And in other time slots, uh, it's, it's being used to maintain and, and you know, transmit, uh, transmit packets in, in, in the mesh. So it's, 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 it's kind of in the old days when you had, I don't know, you have an old sales guy and they have two phones and they, you know, handle two calls at the same time. So it's basically the same for the radio. It's, it's, it's maintaining two conversations at the same time 
uh, in, in parallel without the people in the other end noticing that it's actually you know doing two calls at the same time. Uh, so then to explain a bit how it works. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, we, we are time sharing uh, the radio uh, between the Meyer Mesh stack and, and the Nordic BLE stack. Uh, and, and when it comes to priorities, it's actually the, the BLE stack that has priority in this time slicing. Uh, Myra Mesh will ask permission before accessing the radio. And then it can, of course, be, be denied because uh, the, the, the BLE connection has uh, priority. And why that is important, I, I will come back to a bit later, uh, but that is how it works. Uh, so the BLE part of it uh, is built on the, uh, the off-the-shelf version of the Nordic soft device. So, so in our SDK and in our sort of embedded software, we are including the, the Nordic soft device as a black box. Uh, and we are, it's, you know, it, it's not changed or uh, adapted in any way. It's, it's, it's really the off-the-shelf uh, Nordic soft device. And, and uh, that's important, I think, both from a developer's perspective, because it means that if, if you have developed something for the Nordic soft device, you can still use that software if running also our uh, concurrent Bluetooth sort of feature uh, for, the, for the sort of the Bluetooth functionality that you want to uh, achieve. Uh, but it's also important uh, from a, a compliance perspective, because since we are using the, uh, the Nordic soft device really sort of off the shelf, it also means that Nordic's QDIDs uh, can be referenced when you want to list, uh, do a listing of your Bluetooth product. It, it doesn't require any additional sort of Bluetooth qualification. Uh, if you're running the Nordic chipset and you're running our solution, including the Nordic soft device, you're sort of good to go from a, from a Bluetooth listing uh, perspective. And that, of course, saves a lot of you know, time and, and, and headaches and, and, and money, of course, when you uh, want to Bluetooth qualify your product. Um, and then just something to, uh, to point out. Um, I mean, as we are time sharing the radio between the mesh and the point-to-point -point Bluetooth connection, uh, I mean, the, the BLE connection should be set up with sort of a low to medium data rate. Because if, since the Bluetooth uh, or the BLE point-to-point -point connection has priority, if it denies access to the radio, you know, too many times or, 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 or in, in sort of too, you know, large percentage of the times to the meshing stack, you will start seeing instability in the mesh stack. Because I mean, there are, there is a number of, you know, background uh, sort of packets that need to be sent to keep the mesh synchronized and keep it you know stable so if you define set up your ble connection with a too high data rate uh, you might risk sort of the stability stability of the mesh so that's just something that, that is one limitation uh, that should be taken into account when when developing with this uh, this feature but apart from that, it, it offers the full capabilities and all the possibilities offered by the, uh, the Nordic soft device. Um, and, and okay, so, so this was a lot of details, of course, but, but why is this good then? Why, why, why should I use this? Well, first of all, we see that using a Bluetooth point-to-point -point connection for commissioning uh, is very uh, attractive. Uh, I mean, today, if you send someone out into the field to install or commission something, I mean, the only tool that you can be sure that they have is that they have a Bluetooth uh, transceiver in their pocket. So using Bluetooth as the um, sort of the vehicle to, uh, to commission a product, to, uh, to configure it, to set some, uh, you know, set points, maybe to give it a certain address or, or similar, if you can do that using a, a smartphone or a tablet app, I mean, that's, that's typically very attractive. And uh, with our solution, you have sort of, you, you can do that, but you can also then benefit from the, the features that our reliable mesh uh, offers. Uh, and I mean, it's not only for commissioning, also throughout sort of the product life cycle, you can use this BLE connection also for, for user interaction. Uh, I mean, 
in a conference room, for example, if you want to, uh, I mean, if you want to change the temperature, maybe you say you don't want to force people to get up and, and push a button on the wall, but you rather have maybe a tablet lying on the, uh, the table of the conference room, then you can have an app where you change the set point maybe from 22 degrees to 21 degrees Celsius. And, and then you can sort of leverage the, the BLE connection for that. Uh, you can also use it for, for triggering events like, um, I don't know, maybe uh, opening a door or sort of opening the lock of a door at least. And uh, maybe, you know, turning on the lights or, you know, something like that. So it's, uh, so it's not only for commissioning, but since it's available concurrently also during the, the, the product sort of lifetime while it's in the field, you can also use it for, for user interaction. Uh, it's also very useful for integration of third-party devices into a network. Uh, I mean, let's assume you have a, a network built of your own products running Myra Mesh, our solution, but you still want to have, you know, interoperability with, with other devices. Uh, I mean, having them then communicate, you know, BLE is, is a way to sort of bridge that gap and get that product also into the network. Uh, so it, 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 you know, this connection also acts like a bridgehead between uh, our um, meshing networks and maybe uh, either a, a single uh, device uh, wanting to communicate to and from the network or uh, a second network that you are running in, in parallel to, let's say, our network. Uh, I mean, you can also use it for firmware update. I mean, our, in our mesh stack, I mean, we offer firmware over the air uh, features as sort of a part of the, the package, but maybe sometimes you have certain firmware that might be, maybe you consider it to be too big to, uh, to update uh, through the mesh because you might be running battery powered products where you don't want to waste a lot of battery relaying the firmware across uh, the, uh, the network. Then you can actually, you know, approach the device activate the BLE connection and then stream the network from your phone to the device. Uh, so so that's, that's just a second option uh, regarding uh, firmware over the air. Um, the devices can transmit uh, beacons, uh, I mean regular Bluetooth beacons that you can use for local data visualization. So for example, maybe you have a temp sensor in a, in a room that can then, you know, transmit or, or broadcast its current value as a beacon that then can be picked up by a tablet or a phone or, you know, any other kind of device that would, be, you know, be able to sort of pick up and, and, and uh, you know, use the information in a Bluetooth beacon. Then, I mean, since you're able to uh, transmit beacons, you can, of course, also use those for indoor positioning. Uh, as in, uh, I mean, devices would transmit the beacon and then, of course, there would have to be infrastructure picking up those beacons and, and then also sort of calculating and triangulating uh, the position of a, of a device. And, and last but not least, um, I mean, we have customers uh, also using it basically to save money. Uh, because if you have uh, a Bluetooth uh, sort of connectivity in your product, I mean, you can also argue that you can eliminate the display of the product. Because if you need to make settings or, or, or communicate something to the user, instead of adding a display or buttons or, uh, you know, any other kind of user interface to your products, instead you would uh, use uh, the bluetooth uh, connection to sort of to communicate that to a phone or a tablet and then visualize it in an app which would also allow you to feedback sort of commands or set points or you know actions uh, to the device um, so that was what i was going to say uh, around uh, concurrent bluetooth um, I hope I have intrigued you a bit about what we do at Luma Radio. Uh, these are two of the, uh, uh, the core features of our uh, industrial grade wireless mesh solution that's based on, 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 on Bluetooth uh, silicon from Nordic. Uh, now I'm going to hand over the word to uh, my colleague Eric 
Uh, Eric is going to talk uh, more about what we do specifically uh, within HVAC and building automation. Uh, and that will be sort of the second half of the, uh, the presentation. Okay, so thanks, Peter. Um, so just to set the scene a bit, I'm going to talk a bit about why do you want to have wireless products in your building today? What's all the benefits with having wireless products and what is also driving this market? Um, first of all, I would say that the majority of all the buildings that we, that we have in the Western world today is already built. So this means that a lot of the products that will be sold in this market will be sold to already existing buildings for retrofitting, for renovation, etc. And I would say that for this wireless product is key because it's so much easier installing a wireless product than having a wired taken all, all from the basement up to the room where you want the sensor. So you save a lot of money and time when using the wireless products instead. Uh, another thing is that building owners normally want to have a flexible building. So you have a tenant today that is using 10 rooms in, a, in an office, for example, and then you get a new tenant that wants, for example, 20 rooms. Then you have to change the layout of the, of the building. So when using wireless products instead, it's much easier to change that layout. It's much easier to move a sensor and just do a software update to have the ventilation working in that new layout. Um, and as everyone know, most of us is spending most of the time indoors today. And having a high performing building is also extremely important. Um, so as you can see in the picture here, uh, human beings are extremely affected by the climate or how much CO2 you have in there. I guess everyone has been in a meeting where you sit 10 people in a small room, you start getting tired, unfocused, and this is because there is too much CO2 in there. Um, and to be able to have those high performing buildings you need more sensors so the more sensors you you have the more you know about the building and the rooms you're sitting in um, and in the long run i would say that building owners should also be able to charge more for those high performing buildings since the people working in the buildings are working better they want to go to the office instead of staying home because they don't get tired when they have the meetings etc um, and last but not least, what's also driving this market and the, driving the need for more sensors is regulations. Um, I've, I guess everyone have heard about uh, the climate goals that we have and to be able to achieve those goals, um, we also need to live in a more sustainable way. Um, heating and cooling of buildings is standing for a big part of all the energy that we use. So if we can start heating and cooling the buildings in a smarter way, uh, we would save a lot of energy. This could be things like only heating the building when someone is there, turning off all the screens when you leave the office by connecting the electric electrical sockets. Um, and I guess for, for solving this, there is a need for more sensors. And having wireless sensors, it's much easier to make the installation, retrofitting in old buildings, etc. Um, okay, so that gives us a bit of background to why you should use wireless products in your buildings today. Uh, and as Peter described before, we have a technology that is extremely reliable and also extremely easy to install or at least like the products that use our technology have the potential to being easy to install um, and what we have done for our customers to get going with our this technology and um, also try out our technology in a more easy way is that we have developed a product that we call w modbus um, so in, in buildings today um, you normally use several different protocols for communication. So it can be both wired pro protocols and wireless protocols. 
And as you see in the picture here from Siemens, um, you have different protocols for different levels in the building. So you have like a management level and you have a field uh, level. And I would say like the higher up in the chain you go, the more data you want to send, uh, the more information you want to send. Uh, and Lumeradius technology fits perfect in this space, I would say. So at the automation level and also at the field level device. And here we use protocols like MBUS, it could be Modbus, DALI, Bucknet, KNX, etc. Um, so what we developed is a cable replacement product. So you can take Modbus and replace the cable and just send the Modbus signal as it is over our net uh, network. So Modbus is a master and slave protocol. It's a very old and simple protocol, but it's still used very often in many buildings. So you take one of our devices, you put it at the master, you take one device and put at the slave, you remove the cable and you can send the, the Modbus signal as you used to. So our offering is both an end user product that you just can use in the buildings today. And you could also, if you're developing your own Modbus product, you could integrate our radio module with the W Modbus software included, and you will have a wireless Modbus product out of the box, super simple to start like playing with, to start developing. Um, and I would say like also, this also shows that you could use our protocol itself to send whatever data you want. So you're not like, you don't only have to send Modbus. In the future, you could also, for example, send the KNX protocol maybe. You could send your proprietary protocol that you're using in your products today or whatever you want, basically. Myra is a way of sending data extremely reliable um, and making products that are extremely easy to install. Um, and to give you like a short and like a bit better understanding of how you can use our technology, uh, we have a customer from Finland, um, which is called Prodval. So we've been working with Prodval for over four years. They have their headquarters in Helsinki and I would say they are like the biggest sensor manufacturer for building automations in the Nordic. And what's new from them is that they will have the first fully wireless meshing battery powered CO2 sensor on the market now in Q1. Um, so Prudval have developed a sensor platform based on MyroOS. Uh, where you can buy, you can buy temperature sensors, CO2 sensors, presence sensor present sensors, control units, and so on from Prodval. And all of those sensors are connected to a gateway that, that then is connected to the BMS system, so the building management system. Um, and this system is extremely easy to install. All the sensors are battery driven. So every sensor is a meshing device in the network. You can cover a full building, very simple. Um, and you, as a user, you don't have to pre-plan too much. You can just go to the, the, the office, make the installation and everything should work out of the box. Um, and as Peter described before, we have this best of both worlds. So we have, we can use both Bluetooth and you can have the meshing running in the background. And this is exactly what Prodval is using. So they have developed a phone application for installation for making changes to the system. Uh, and I would say like nearly all installers today will have a phone. They can just simply download the app for installation and Prodval didn't have to um, develop like a second device for installation, for example, which many old um, products normally had. So they had like one, just one product for installation, for example. Um, and when the system is up and running, as I said before, the building owner will have a 
a much better understanding. They, they will know like the CO2 levels, the temperature in the building. Um, yeah, they will see how the building, so they will have a much better building, so to say. Um, and as you also can see in this picture is that, for example, if you were to remove one of those walls, it's super simple to just move one of the sensors or add an extra sensor. And then you just make changes to the gateway to explain like how the layout is now. And then you have a fully working building again, instead of have, having an electrician there, moving the cables and all of that. So you could make those changes much, much faster, um, which is a huge benefit. Um, and to a real example, uh, this is a shopping mall in, in, uh, in the UK uh, where they have, where they are using Prodval's products today. So they needed to replace some CO2 sensors. I mean, they already had power at place, but they didn't have the signal cables. So what did they do? They installed Lumeradius wireless mesh and where they send the uh, the um, signals over the mesh, but they still power the product from the power cable. So this is a really good, good uh, example where they use the products in a really crowded space. We have the cognitive coexistence, the traffic it is always working, even though we have a lot of people in the building. Uh, they never have to go there and like tune the devices. Everything just works from the installation and even though you change the layout of the building and so on. Um, and that's everything from me and Peter. So now we're open for questions and we're going to give some answers to all the questions we got. So, uh, yeah, uh, hi everyone again. Uh, we, Eric and I have also now brought uh, two more people uh, into the discussion and the guy that you see to my right, as you look at your screen, it's Johannes, our product owner for uh, Myra. And we also have brought Daniel, our field application engineer, uh, who you will see in a minute. Uh, okay, you see him now. <laughs> uh, so we will uh, take a look at a few of the questions that we have got uh, during uh, the webinar, and, and I will start. Uh, the first question relates to power consumption and, and whether our solution with um, sort of algorithms for adaptive frequency hopping consumes uh, more power or, or, or less power. And I think, uh, I mean, uh, sort of ultra low power consumption is, is one of our uh, unique selling points. Uh, we can run our meshing networks uh, on as little as 16 microamps, meaning that you have 16 microamps average consumption of a meshing node for the, the radio communication uh, in a network. And, and this is, um, I mean, much, much lower than you would have uh, compared to, for example, Bluetooth mesh or, or, or Zigbee or Thread. Uh, it's also, I would say, uh, on par with what you would have from a, a regular sort of point-to-point -point Bluetooth connection, uh, you know, if, if you sort of have a, a comparable sort of throughput uh, and so forth. Um, so, I mean, power consumption is, of course, sort of the algorithm itself, the CPU might consume a bit more power doing these calculations in the background, but you earn all that back through, uh, I mean, doing fewer retransmissions, uh, because if you transmit once, uh, thanks to doing some calculations instead of transmitting twice. I mean, you save a lot of uh, power from not using the radio more than you had to. I mean, the CPU is much more fuel efficient than, than the radio, so to speak. So I think, uh, yeah, so from a power consumption, I think we are performing very well. Yes, and I can just fill in by saying that the majority of the processing in this predictive model is actually done on the root node, which in most cases are mains powered. So the sensor nodes or the meshing nodes are mainly measuring and reporting data, but the sort of number crunching is done on the root node where power consumption usually isn't an issue. Yeah. Then moving on to the next question, here I will let Johannes also elaborate a bit on, on our sort of concurrent, uh, our time sharing feature and whether it can also uh, incorporate other stacks than Bluetooth. Uh, yes, uh, the question was, is it possible to set Lumen Radio Protocol and Bluetooth, Zigbee, Thread in the same device at the same time? 
And the short answer is yes. Uh, I think that question came a bit early in the, in the Bluetooth time slicing. So I think it's clear that we can run Bluetooth concurrently by time slicing on the radio. Uh, we are working on support for Zigbee and Thread as well, because that's a question of, of modulation, uh, Bluetooth 5 versus 802.15.4 Phi. So we are introducing support for 802.15.4 in the very near future, uh, which will enable time slicing between Zigbee and Thread as well. But there is a caveat to this because uh, of the Nordic soft device, because Uh, we deliver Myra OS alongside the Nordic soft device. So there you already have a Bluetooth stack that is certified and ready to go. But for in order for you to have a Zigbee or Thread, you would also have to have a, a Zigbee stack or a Thread stack to time slice with, which we don't include in our deliverables. Uh, and that would, uh, of course, incur some development costs and, and also some certification costs. But it, uh, it will be possible in the very near future. Uh, and just to sort of point it out, I mean, obviously, in order to time slice with the uh, Zigbee or Thread, you need to run uh, a chipset uh, yes. that supports both uh, files. Such, for example, it would uh, sort of work on the MRF52840 uh, since it has the dual files, but it would not work on the MRF52832 because that only has the, uh, the Bluetooth file. Yes, precisely. Um, Then we also had a question about throughput and latency of a, of a concurrent Bluetooth connection. Yes, <laughs> this is a very good question uh, with a kind of a bad answer because the answer is basically it depends. Uh, because we are time slicing, uh, you could uh, sort of allocate all of your time to doing Bluetooth. And then um, Uh, then you would have like the bandwidth limitations that you would expect from that particular chipset, which is for the 840, I think is one megabit per second, uh, something like that. Uh, but if you also want to run Myra at the same time, you would have to look into uh, what performance are you expecting uh, from the Myra network? Because we have uh, different ways of configuring uh, a node to be in the network where you can trade off power consumption to throughput and latency. So if you have a very like bandwidth sensitive system, you would configure it to have a, a fast, what we call rates. Uh, then you would have a high duty cycle of the radio and you would be more sensitive to interruptions. So in those cases, we do not recommend running uh, concurrent Bluetooth basically at all. Uh, so this could be in an installation with, with high bandwidth requirements on the, for example, root node. Uh, it would have to be able to service all, all the meshing nodes uh, in some way. We usually configure that to have a higher bandwidth and, and running concurrent Bluetooth on that node could be detrimental to the minor network, or you would have to be kind of sparse in, in how much Bluetooth you're actually using. But in a sort of lower intensity application on a sensor node far out in the network that's running on battery, it's, it's running slower rates, uh, not that much bandwidth, uh, you could run Bluetooth basically without interruption. So it, it's a trade-off uh, of, of what you want to do with your Myra network, basically. But, but you have this sort of flexibility of, of actually optimizing these rates Uh, of in the mesh uh, together with the uh, sort of the data rate that you set for your DLE connection. So you yes. need to maintain that balance. Exactly. The more data you need to sort of uh, transmit in your mesh network, uh, you know, the less bandwidth you can allocate to your DLE connection and vice versa. Mm. So it's it's basically sort of a zero sum game. You need to balance these two uh, sort of uh, connections so that there are enough time slots for everyone to sort of stay happy. Exactly. And, and we are using the same modulation uh, with the same bandwidth as the Bluetooth. So, so it really is this zero sum game. Yeah. Um, then next question. Um, it's Eric that is going to elaborate a bit around the wireless Modbus. Yeah. So we got some questions around the W Modbus. Um, and uh, the first question is, is it possible to connect several Modbus slaves to one W Modbus module? I'll, I'll, I'll say you can read this question in two ways, but I'll explain both, I guess. Um, so to one Modbus master, you can have 100 slaves in our network. Uh, but 
be one, behind one W Modbus slave, you can only connect one Modbus slave. So that's at least in the first version. We're looking at developing maybe more functionality in the future where you can connect several Modbus devices be, behind one slave. But for the first version, it's one slave behind one W Modbus. Um, then we got one question, what is the difference or advantage of using Myra to transmit a Modbus versus, versus any other wireless technology? And I would say this goes back to what Peter mentioned before. So all the core values that we have within Myra OS is like, so you have cognitive coexistence for reliability. Uh, it doesn't matter if the environment changes in the building, the network will still be up and running. So it's extremely reliable. Um, also, concurrent Bluetooth, ease of installation, and what Johannes mentioned before, the throughput. So there are a lot of values within Myra OS that is also beneficial for sending Modbus. Um, and then a third question was, why did we pick uh, the Modbus protocol at first and not any other protocol? And the easy answer is that we had some customers that were very interested in this. Uh, and also that it's um, it's Modbus is standing for a big part part of the market within pro the protocols within buildings. Um, so I guess that was the questions we got around Modbus for now at least. Um, then I'm handing over to Daniel here. Uh, yeah, then I take the next question. So the question is: Isn't a battery-based network high maintenance? And what to do when the batteries run out? So yeah, that's a very good question. And of course, I mean, that could be a potential issue, uh, but our benefit, we would say, is that we try to optimize against having a very low current consumption. And as Peter mentioned before, we can get all the way down to uh, ten of, uh, tens of microamps. Um, so we think that, that minimizes the problems in favor of what you potentially don't have to do, for example, using a cable to, to install that sensor, for example. Uh, but of course, that puts constraints on the application and when designing it uh, with everything that we said before with comparing bandwidth to power consumption. And uh, I mean, in the end goal, of course, if a battery runs out, that needs to be changed, for example. Uh, but we, we believe that we can, can use it for a very long time, for example, then. Yeah. Okay. So then I think we hand over to Peter for the next question. Yeah. Uh... We had a question around what Nordic uh, chipsets uh, do we support, and, and currently uh, it's uh, the two that I mentioned, just mentioned. It's the NRF52832, and it's the NRF52840. Uh, I think in, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they both have sort of pros and cons. Uh, obviously, the 840 being uh, a slightly more expensive solution, but it also has a higher output power straight from the chip, which we like as RF geeks. Uh, and also, it has the dual Fi, so you can run both sort of Bluetooth based uh, communication or Bluetooth Fi based communication and 802.15.4 Fi based communication, which we also believe is a, is a great benefit uh, from a sort of a versatility and uh, interoperability. Uh, perspective yeah and it also has more ram and flash yeah. you know, which some of our customers are having a bit of an issue fitting into the 832 so we generally recommend the 840 yeah good let's see what else do we have maybe we have time for one more question um, we got the question around presentation materials and as robin pointed out yes that will be shared um, we also got a question that around buildings, sort of, you know, how often in practice do we see sort of walls being moved and so forth? I mean, I think, I mean, our, our technology is used a lot within office buildings. I think that's one of our sort of sweet spots and sort of commercial buildings. And, and I think having a, a flexible building is today uh, a necessity because you have you know, companies moving in and out, you have companies uh, requesting much more flexible office space, and you actually see, I mean, one of our sort of, the rules of thumb of our customers is that if you have um, uh, an office building that's, let's say, has more than you know, three floors, it's in constant remodeling, because there's always one tenant moving in and there's always one tenant moving out. 
and, and this sort of requires flexibility from the building infrastructure. And here we believe that wireless technology can add a lot of value. If you put up a new wall and you need to have sort of, you know, two temp sensors instead of one, putting up a new battery powered wireless sensor is like placing a sticker on the wall, while putting up a traditional cabled uh, Modbus sensor is, I mean, it's, first of all, it's ugly because you would have visible cabling and, and, you know, building owners don't like that. And secondly, it takes a lot of time. So um, I think it's more than you think would be the answer to how often do you actually require sort of uh, flexibility in, in these building infrastructure systems. Um, Maybe elaborate, elaborate a bit around range better. Or... Yes, then, okay, last question then, because I think we also have to respect the time. Uh, what, what's the standard range or the distance between uh, our BLE nodes in the indoor environment? And I, and I choose to interpret that when we actually run our solution on the Bluetooth 5. Uh, because what we see is that thanks to our optimal channel selection, we can you know, extend the range of the, uh, of the uh, sort of, of, of the normal sort of Bluetooth uh, chipset. If we then also use a power amplifier, since we are allowed to, um, to transmit with 100 milliwatts, I mean, we can, of course, get, it, get additional range uh, that, that sort of a lot sort of exceeds what you would see from a, a regular Bluetooth product. And when using a power amplifier, uh, then we, our sort of rule of thumb is that then you typically get somewhere between 50 to 100 meters in a commercial building, you know, penetrating walls, floors, uh, glass partition, partitions, and so forth. So, and I think here the benefit is, of course, that you, you, you get a system that is very easy to install because it's very forgiving. You don't have to do radio planning and, and, and do any site service because it's, 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 the range is long enough to basically accommodate almost any sort of physical topology. And we've seen uh, when you sort of couple this with a good antenna, you could reach line of sight upwards of a kilometer. Yeah. So, so very good, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it. I mean, obviously, if we didn't answer your specific question, because there were a few more, uh, I mean, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. Uh, should we get uh, the battery power sensor one? Okay. <laughs> I feel for that one. All right. Uh, can I take right. just a moment? Yeah. Uh, battery power sensor, any experience on battery life? And yes, we do. We have our customer, Svegon, who is running a lot of uh, battery power devices. And then they are like implementing a lithium ion 2 AA battery solution. And, and sort of the design philosophy is that you don't account to, to change the batteries. You, you want the batteries to last for the product lifetime. So then we are looking at like 10 to 15 years uh, running. Uh, so that's sort of our philosophy. So we want to, to sort of kill this myth that you can't run mesh on batteries because you have to replace the batteries. And we say rather no, we are so power efficient that we exceed the, the, the product lifetime. Uh, and, and we've, like, to this day, that, that has held true uh, mm -hmm. in our installations. And also another comment there. I mean, uh, today the topic was HVAC and building automation, but we are also uh, active within the industrial space. And here our customer SKF, for example, are also running uh, meshing uh, battery powered sensors. And those sensors are actually at ATEX uh, approved. And ATEX is means that you can use them in an explosion, uh, sort of they are explosion proof. You can use them in environments with risk of explosions, which means that they are actually sealed. So the battery is not, you're not able to replace the battery. Yeah. So it's, it's basically the sensor becomes a consumable. And then of course the battery lifetime is, is extremely important. And then they are also looking at, uh, you know, uh, up to 10 years of, of battery time. Um, which is, you know, necessary also to make sort of a, a good business case because it's, it's physically impossible to take out the battery because it's it's sealed uh, with like a, a resin uh, on the inside. Yeah, and and in such an application, I mean, thread isn't applicable at all. No. It, it just doesn't support it. No. So I think battery-powered mesh is, is, is of course, that, that's what we do. Um, but I will start. Uh, and the first question was related to... Uh, well, uh, whether it was possible to use cognitive coexistence and our technology together with, uh, I mean, uh, battery operation. And I think as, as Eric has described, uh, I mean, in the Prudual use case, it's, it's definitely uh, possible. Uh, I mean, 
you can argue that for for sure since you we are using the uh, the cpu to to run certain algorithms you know uh, that that of course consumes maybe a, a tiny bit of power but on the other hand i think having cognitive coexistence avoids a lot of retransmissions so we actually also benefit uh, from that uh, regarding uh, power consumption but then one thing that we didn't mention was that uh, I mean, our Myra Mesh is also a time synchronized, uh, sort of time slotted uh, solution. Uh, so we can duty, uh, duty cycle the radio very hard if needed. And we provide sort of a gearbox to the developer to basically set the performance rate that you need to balance sort of power consumption and throughput. Uh, so you can run our solution on as little as 16 microamps for while still you know uh, being a mesh node in the network uh, and this is why you know companies like Trudeau can achieve battery times of you know five ten years on, on, on their products uh, now I will hand over to Daniel who will uh, answer some other questions uh, yes okay so for the first question it is uh, for the Bluetooth side uh, are we using the full soft device or are we only using the soft device controller? Uh, so in our application, we are um, using the entire soft device. So uh, both from an application level and from our perspective, you have the full uh, capabilities of using the entire soft device. Um, okay, and I will also continue with the next question. And that is uh, for TX sharing, uh, fatigue sharing radio is relatively simple. In RX side, however, it is how is it distinguished between Bluetooth and mesh traffic? Um, yeah, okay, so how we handle that? So, I mean, as you may know, first and foremost, uh, this is not fully controlled by us. I mean, the Bluetooth communication is handled by the soft device, and is uh, the soft device is, of course, then negotiating with the Bluetooth master or the phone that you are connected to. Uh, so they uh, negotiate which which slots they're going to use for transferring. So what we try to do is try to be resilient against being blocked by the Bluetooth communication. So as an example, we use uh, acknowledgments on our link layer in order to be able to retransmit packets and so on to be able to guarantee that a that a packet is reached to its destination. Uh, and also, as Peter and Eric said before here, that also puts constraints, of course, on the application developer of both the uh, the mesh application and the Bluetooth application uh, in order for trying to use a good margin of, of Bluetooth communication and, and mesh, um, yeah, mesh packets, so to say, uh, in parallel in order for both to be uh, working su successfully, so to say, uh, since we are, of course, then sharing the same radio as said before. Yeah, okay, so then we also got the question around um, concurrent Bluetooth and if we could do concurrent Bluetooth mesh. And today that's not possible, but that's something we're working on for the future. And I mean, we're also working on having concurrent other meshing stacks as well. So hopefully that will be for the future. Um, yeah. And then I think Peter. Yes, and uh, then we also had a question around um, configuring multiple devices at the same time. Uh, Robin, would you mind switching the camera? Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, I mean, the way that you can do that today is, I mean, since the Nordic Silicon, for example, supports NFC, I mean, we have an NFC driver uh, available which means that you could, if, if you want to sort of do bulk commissioning in sort of in a factory and so forth, I mean, we have customers uh, using NFC uh, for that. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's one uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, and I think you could also argue that it might be possible also to use Bluetooth uh, to commission uh, multiple devices at the same time. But I would say in, in, in general, I think the most common procedure that our, our, our customers are using, it is actually sort of a, a one by one uh, procedure. Uh, then the next question. Uh, uh, I, um, it was, let's see. One, right? Yes, okay, sorry. Uh, also, it was related to mass uh, sort of update of, of uh, you know firmware updates uh, for multiple devices uh, at the same time. 
and that's also possible. And let me elaborate a bit on the uh, the firmware over the air feature of, of Myra Mesh. Uh, I would say it's designed for being very uh, power efficient, uh, to some extent at the expense of, let's say, lead time. Um, because you know how we handle uh, firmware uh, distribution in the network, it's that it's, it sort of trickles out into the network and it uh, sort of also piggybacks on, on other uh, communication that is happening in the network. Uh, so it, it's basically, you know, starting from the gateway, it, it you know, you know, trickles out from device to device, uh, and then you can sort of decide as a, you know, as a user or as as an application developer whether you want it to do sort of a synchronous a restart, or whether you want devices to restart sort of one by one once they have received uh, the new firmware. Um, we can also handle multiple images in the network in, in parallel. We have sort of different, let's say, slots uh, for that. So, so yes, I mean, you don't have to unicast a uh, new firmware device by device. Uh, you would make a new firmware sort of file available, and that would then be distributed to all the, uh, uh, the devices in the network. Uh, so it's, it's you can also say it, it's it's sort of a it's a file transfer mechanism uh, that we uh, make available for you know transferring of of of, of files out uh, to devices in the network. So it, it, it's not necessarily only firmware; it could also be other files that you need to transfer to to multiple uh, devices. Yeah. Yep. And then I think we've got some questions around power consumption. I think that's for you, Daniel. Right? Yes, I can take that, take that one. So yeah, the question is, uh, we'd like to know about the power consumption. How much is it using? Uh, so the boring answer is, of course, it depends. Uh, and that depends on uh, which configuration you choose to use the, the mesh network in. So we have something that we call a network rate, where you can sort of dictate uh, the bit rate of the radio and also then uh, the power consumption. But we can come as far down to as 10 microamps for using with only the radio on one of our slowest rates, so to say. Uh, and then it, of course, increases from there. Uh, then, it, then that is also, of course, for the radio. And then it, when you add peripherals and stuff like that, that will also, of course, uh, increase power consumption then. Uh, I can also take the next question here. So that is a question regarding uh, if our solution is built on routing or if it's a BLE mesh style flooding approach. Uh, so we are actually using a routing uh, methodology. And since we are fully IPv6 uh, compatible as well, all the nodes are addressable in the, the network, uh, which means that we support both unicast transmission in the network and also uh, link local multicast uh, transmissions. Okay. And then back to Peter. Uh, we also had one question around handling interference uh, in the uh, the 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, and I mean, and just to emphasize, I think this is exactly what our uh, cognitive coexistence technology does. Uh, it, it it makes sure uh, the devices, uh, you know, use optimal sort of channel selection for for transmissions. And it also means that we try to avoid uh, all others uh, that you know want to uh, use you know that are active in the same environment, uh, and this is also why we why we believe we are you know being sort of more tolerant and also utilizing the the spectrum in a, you know in, in an efficient way uh, that leave leaves rooms for others. Um, then maybe back to Eric again for a question around the wireless Modbus. Yeah, so we got one question around W Modbus. Uh, if you could add some application code inside your Modbus device, if you buy the radio module from us. And uh, for the first version, this will not be possible, but we're looking at that you should be able to, for example, pull different registers uh, within Modbus uh, to present that over, for example, BLE beacons to have a phone where you can see the temperature in the room or some ad other data that you want to pull from the device, the Modbus device you have. So it's coming, but it's not on the market right now. Um, is there any other questions that we have? Yeah, maybe if, 
I can take a, a few more questions. This is Peter again. Uh, we got more questions around, I think, power sort of uh, consumption and, and sort of power management or whatever we should call it. Um, we, Daniel mentioned 10 microamps and, and, and to get down to those uh, sort of uh, current consumption levels, you would have to run your device as a leaf node uh, in the network. Uh, and that is, it's still a, 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 net, a node or a device that is fully addressable and, and you know, definitely you know, synchronized and part of the network, but it would not uh, sort of accept any children. So it's sort of egoistic in that sense. It's, it's part of the network, but it will not help anyone else to, to relay their information. If you want to run a meshing device that also uh, relays information on behalf of others, then the, the, the power consumption you can achieve is in the range of 16 microamps. So that is sort of the, uh, uh, the, the sort of the, the bottom uh, for, for a meshing device. And, and, and again, this is sort of dictated by these rates, this gearbox that we offer, that which allows you to, to push the, the stack in, in different modes, uh, so to speak. Then we also had one question around how we control TX output power. Um, and I mean, in the radio modules that we offer, uh, we are integrating a, a power amplifier. And the reason for that is since we have this, uh, you know, um, we are allowed to transmit with 100 milliwatts, you need the, the power amplifier to get up to, to those levels to, uh, to 20 dBMs. Uh, and, but then, I mean, if we do concurrent Bluetooth, for example, uh, for example, we are limited to 10 dBm. Uh, and, and this sort of, you know, managing this and then handling the, uh, the power amplifier is, is something that our solution does. It's, it's, it's not something that you have to worry about as a user. So uh, in the case you would, you know, use the power amplifier, but you also want to run concurrent Bluetooth. When sort of the radio is running the BLE stack, it's, it's transmitting with 10 TBMs out of power, while in the time slots when it's uh, sort of acting as part of the Myra mesh, it would transmit with 20 DBMs uh, out of power and then sort of having the benefit of an extended range. Um, I think that is it. Uh, we, we didn't answer all the questions, uh, but we also want to respect the time. Uh, if your um, uh, if your answer uh, sorry if your question wasn't answered, I mean feel free to reach out to us. Um, we will also have a look at the question list and see if uh, if there's something in specific that we want to add maybe to the notes uh, that would be uh, sent out. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, if you want more information. But Thanks a lot, and I will uh, give it back to, to Robin. Thank you, Peter, Eric, and Daniel. Uh, that's all we had time for today. Uh, thanks for uh, all the questions you have asked. Uh, if your question wasn't answered, you can either reach out to Nordic on devson.nordicsemi.com or to Lumen on lumenradio.com slash developers. Remember to go to uh, webinars.nordicsemi.com to sign up for all our future webinars and thanks for watching and have a nice day. <laughs>